in poverty waits for a sponsor is another day of hopelessness. There are thousands of kids who've been waiting over a year in their wait. Sponsor a child with compassion today. Just text the word radio to 833-93. Is this the This is the KBLA Sports Minute with Ray Richardson. Ray Richardson. USC is in the Sweet 16 of the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament for the first time in 30 years. The Trojans beat Kansas by 18 last night at the Galen Center. Freshman All-American Juju Watkins had 28 points, 11 rebounds, and 5 assists. USC will play Baylor Saturday in the Portland Regional Semifinals. UCLA had a tough time with Creighton last night but held on to win by 4, 24 points from sophomore guard Kiki Rice. The Bruins advance to the Sweet 16 in the Albany Regional in upstate New York. Next up for the Bruins is the Defending national champion LSU on Saturday. The Clippers gave up 133 points to Indiana last night. They lost by 17. Fifth straight home loss for the Clippers. Russell Westbrook had 14 points and 7 assists in his first game back from a broken hand. The bronze left ankle is bothering him again. He's doubtful for tonight's game at Milwaukee. No debates, no speculation, just the info you need. That's your KBLA Sports Minute. I'm Ray Richardson on KBLA Talk 1580. All I need is one mic. Reparations Now has been a rallying cry in this country and around the world for decades. But the demand has taken on new urgency with growing momentum on the issue led by the state of California, which has completed an extensive study and put forth recommendations to enact reparations. California's reparations actions have huge nationwide implications. The California Task Force was the first of its kind in the nation, and the states of New York and Colorado recently voted to take on the issue. Dozens of cities from coast to coast, including San Francisco, Boston, Los Angeles, and Detroit, have started their own reparations commissions. One of the first known reparationists was Callie House, who toured the nation advocating for reparations in the 1890s. But never in this nation's history has the movement to heal the harms of enslavement, institutionalized racism, and the system of white supremacy seemed so strong. The topic remains untouchable for most elected officials, and the call for reparations has not yet garnered widespread public support. Polling shows that most Californians agree that black fellow citizens are still suffering from the damage done by slavery and Jim Crow, but they still do not support cash reparations. The California Legislative Black Caucus has introduced a package of proposals for bills that do not include one penny of cash compensation, restitution, or repair. Governor Newsom and other lawmakers have distanced themselves from the concept of cash payments. While Newsom is right, cash alone will not repair our collective harm, the state's goofy legislative package ignoring monetary payments is disingenuous. California lawmakers need to step up and put a reparations bill for cash payments on the table. The issue of how it is funded, the timeline, or whether it impacts our current budget challenges can be addressed. But we must strike while the iron is hot or the window of opportunity will pass us by. If you agree that it's time for our lawmakers to add a bill enacting cash payments to their lineup, Call them at 916-319-3868 and say, if it doesn't include cash, it ain't reparations. That's 916-319-3868. Tell them Cali House sent you. From Bruce's Beach to the California Task Force, the Golden State is a trailblazer when it comes to reparations. The world is watching. We must rise to the historical moment and set a precedent for cash payments along with legislative remedies and policies addressing the systemic badges of slavery and Jim Crow. We must insist on measures significant enough to help close the racial wealth gap. California must stand for cash and the time for reparations is now. For KBLA Talk 1580, I'm Dominique DePrima. We welcome your comments.
live from historic Lamert Park in Los Angeles, California. I'm Tavis Smiley, and I'm so glad to see you and me uh, back in stride again. Before we get started with today's show, let me invite you to follow me on Facebook and Instagram at the real Tavis Smiley and get updates on X, that's formerly Twitter, at Tavis Smiley. By the way, should you miss any part of today's program or want to catch up on previous shows, you can always visit the TavisSmileyShow.com. That's the TavisSmileyShow.com or wherever you get your podcast and listen to the Tavis Smiley podcast version of this live program at your Leisure, another great show on tap for you today in our second hour. They call you Lady Luck, but there is room for doubt. At times you have a very unladylike way of running out you're on this date with me the pickings have been lush and yet before this evening is over you might give me the brush you might forget your manners you might refuse to stay and so the best that i can do is pray luck be a lady tonight Luck be a lady tonight. With all due respect to the chairman of the board, we are betting on Luck black today. Of course, around here, we always bet on black. Longtime Las Vegas historian Clay T. D. White with an oral history of Sin City's black community, the black story, if you will, of Las Vegas today in our two. In our third hour, former CNN anchor Don Lemon on his controversial interview with Elon Musk, the bizarre aftermath of that quick conversation and where Don Lemon goes from here. Of course, Don ain't broke. Uh, we all read about that uh, $24 million settlement that Don uh, agreed to with CNN. I ain't mad at him. Uh, anyway, Don Lemon uh, for the hour in our final hour on this program today. But in this first hour, yesterday we spoke with filmmaker Robert Greenwald about his powerful new documentary called Beyond Bars. We commence today's show, as promised, in dialogue with the subject of that documentary, former San Francisco DA Chase Boudin, presently serving as executive director of the Criminal Law and Justice Center at UC Berkeley School of Law. Before we commence our conversation, some sound from the documentary Beyond Bars. We have two systems of justice, right? We have one for the wealthy and the well-connected and a different one for everybody else. And that's exactly what we are fighting to change. We are just getting started because we knew that fixing a system that has failed us, not just for decades, but for generations, was not the work of one year or one term, of one man or woman or one office. It is work that requires a sustained social movement. The movement is alive and well from coast to coast, from north to south. This is a movement, not a moment in history. His story is quite a fascinating one, and that uh, is an understatement. We will commence a conversation for the hour. The Chase of Boudin, when we come forward on Tavis Smiley. Interrogating and unpacking. That's what we do around here. You're listening to Tavis Smiley. Smiley. Hey, y'all. Mona Swain here from Target's new YouTube series, My Card is Full, where we feature black founders and creators highlighting their connection to our community. As an actor and content creator, I love using my voice to inspire young black women who look like me. When it comes to feeding my shine, seeing myself reflected in black-owned and founded products at Target brings me joy. Together, we are Black Beyond Measure. Learn more at Target.com slash Black Beyond Measure. Cookie wants to be a professional wrestler. 
I'm Cookie Serratos and I'm 11 years old. She also wants to win all the medals. That's why Cookie and her family make every day count, squeezing out her best with Go Go Squeeze. Okay, Cookie, let's break for a Go Go Squeeze. Go Go Squeeze fruit on the go pouches are a nutritious snack made from 100% fruit with no sugar added. Go Cookie! Because when you nurture your kids, you squeeze out the best in them. Squeeze out the best with Go Go Squeeze. Not a low calorie food. Products range from 11 to 13 grams of sugar and 60 to 70 calories per serving. Hi, this is Scott Trout of Cordell & Cordell. If you're a dad who is facing divorce, there are extra layers of stress that may include stereotypes and assumptions. No two situations are the same. Our legal experience and dedication prepare us for whatever legal challenges we face together. You need a partner you can count on. For more than 30 years, Cordell & Cordell has represented men in divorce. 1455 Frazee Road, Suite 1050, San Diego, California, 92108. Online at CordellCordell.com. Pizza's here. Oh, great. I'd love some, but I'm worried about my stomach issues. If you're worried about having diarrhea, gas, bloating, stomach pain, or loose oily stools, it may not just be stomach issues. It could be a condition called exocrine pancreatic insufficiency, or EPI. With EPI, the pancreas doesn't release enough enzymes to break down food, but EPI is manageable. Use the symptom checker on identifyepi.com and talk to your doctor. That's identifyepi.com. Sponsored by Advocate. We must understand the politics of our community, and we must know what politics is supposed to produce. produce. This election year, KBLA Talk 1580 is the place for politics, unapologetically progressive politics, and we've got two of the best and brightest to help you cut through all the noise. Weekdays at 1 p.m., it's a more perfect union with Dr. Nick Quarterly Corte. And at 4 p.m., it's Ariva Martin in real time. He's the university professor and distinguished member of the White House Correspondents Association. She's a best selling author and Harvard trained civil rights lawyer. And they are both here every day to help guide you through all the sh this year because you know it's going to get deep. Get your politics on weekday afternoons at 1 p.m. and 4 p.m. with a more perfect union. Hosted by Dr. Nick Quarterly Corte and Ariva Martin in real time. Only on KBLA Talk 1580. We've got your black. black. Sounds different, huh? This, this is Tavis Smiley. Before we commence our conversation with Chase Boudin, uh, our thoughts and prayers uh, go out to uh, the citizens of Baltimore and the, the great state of Maryland, uh, as you probably have heard. A uh, major developing story there. A ship struck a Baltimore bridge, uh, a bridge there, uh, uh, prompting uh, workers to stop traffic moments before the bridge collapsed. Um, uh, that's a blessing. Uh, the ship uh, called for a mayday, made a mayday uh, warning. So they knew they were about to hit this bridge. And so they, uh, again, made a mayday call, uh, prompting workers to, uh, to, uh, to try and stop traffic as much as they could. Moments before the bridge collapsed, rescuers are searching at this hour uh, for six workers who were on the Francis Scott Key Bridge. When it collapsed, the bridge, of course, if you know anything about Baltimore, uh, as I do, it's part of Interstate 695. It's a critical traffic route in the Baltimore area. So I have seen uh, Governor Wes Moore, the brother governor, all over the news talking about this, as are others. Uh, and so, again, our thoughts and prayers for the people of Baltimore as they search for these persons missing due to this ship. Uh, uh, hitting uh, a bridge uh, in Baltimore. Uh, and so, again, we are keeping that in uh, thoughts and prayers as we move through this hour and through this show. As we are heard, uh, this program is in that area. Uh, it's now my great delight to welcome to this program, Chase Boudin. Chase, how are you, sir? I'm doing well. Great to be with you, my friend. It, it's good to have you back on this program. Thank you for your time. Um, we had, as you heard me say a moment ago, Robert Greenwald on yesterday and just a wonderful conversation for the hour with Robert talking about this documentary. As I know the audience have been, I've been getting messages all day and all night, and I've seen people posting, uh, waiting to hear from you, as I promised them yesterday. So thank you for honoring your commitment to be here today in the first hour of this program. Let me just start with this. Um, uh, why would one who has been through all that you've been through, and we'll unpack that for the rest of this hour, but why would one subject oneself to a documentary? I'm glad you did. Uh, but there's a lot about your backstory, man, that comes out in this documentary. Why, why sit for all those hours for a documentary? You know, I ask myself that question a lot. Of times, <laughs> i got to be honest with you. Uh, <laughs> uh, you know, but, but seriously, um, you know, I think um, we had, we had the, the, 
the recognition while I was in office um, and while they were, you know, throwing everything they could at me and the recalls and, and the, the smear campaigns, mm-hmm. you know, we, we had a, a recognition that we were making history, that we were part of history. And we wanted to make sure that there was an opportunity to document what we were doing, what we were up against, uh, the difficult decisions we were making, the, the successes we were proud of, the mistakes that we were learning from. Um, and to have that documented, not just by the, you know, quick hit 24 hour news cycle, um, often, you know, very misleading mainstream media, but also um, to have someone on the inside who could really tell the story uh, mm-hmm. of what I was going through, what my family was going through, what the office was trying to accomplish. Um, and, you know, we respected the work that Robert Greenwald had done on other issues, mm-hmm. his other films. He did one, uh, for example, on misdemeanors, um, looking at how, uh, you know, p- petty offenses, crimes that are defined by the law as petty, are being used to continue to exacerbate and amplify racial disparities and systemic exclusion of, of marginalized communities. I've watched that film. I was uh, inspired by it. And I, you know, I said to him um, when he reached out and asked if he could do one on us, I said yes. Um, and mm-hmm. then uh, we spent many, many, many hours over many months, many years, in fact, yeah. working with him and his team letting them follow us, letting them be a fly on the wall during office meetings, during family conversations, uh, at the, at the, you know, election night of the recall itself. Um, they were there, uh, really throughout several years of very intense activity. And, uh, the final product is, as you said, a, yeah. a, a really powerful and compelling film. Um, this conversation with Chase Boudin matters for a lot of reasons. Um, uh, for those who don't know his backstory of missed yesterday's program, I'm going to play some clips for you here in just a second, uh, as we move through this conversation. But, uh, Chase Boudin was part of that wave, uh, just a few years ago of black, uh, not black, but prog- uh, black, including some black ones, obviously, but progressive DAs, some of whom were black, are black, but these progressive DAs who were elected across the country. And no sooner than many of them had been elected, people started trying to recall them. So it, it, I said yesterday, we were sort of politi- politically schizophrenic, as it were, that we, we, we knew something was wrong with law enforcement in this country writ large. We started electing progressive DAs all across the country. And again, no sooner had they gotten in their seat, uh, literally in Chase's case, three days after he got elected, people started trying to recall him. He hadn't done anything yet. Uh, and, and so it's, it, there's a conversation here about how progressive um, we really uh, uh, truly want to be versus what we say we want. Uh, and that's really the question of America always. Is it not not who we say we want to be, but who we are really? Who are we really as a nation? That is the fundamental question. But uh, uh, Chase comes to being DA in San Francisco with a fascinating backstory. Uh, take a listen to some sound uh, from the documentary Beyond Bars. I took my son to the babysitter and assumed that I would be back to pick him up later in the day. It's hard to imagine that, and yet I think the way in which denial can work is that you literally can block out consequences. I think that I was completely out of touch. One thing that revolutionary groups need to function is funds. They usually don't get grants from the Rockefeller Foundation, the Ford Foundation. So we knew there was danger, but we didn't dwell on that. White people are much less likely to get stopped and questioned by the cops. They would be looking for black people specifically. We felt that if once they got into the truck and it was a white couple driving, it was very unlikely to be a problem. I left my 14-month-old child at the babysitter. I had ruptured a most basic human bond, violating a mother's responsibility to protect and care for her baby. We dropped them off together, and it was sort of like Another day, you drop your kid off at the babysitter, and you go about your, you go to your job, and you pick the kid up. If I could only replay that day, I would not have been there. I would not have gone. The baby that they are talking about, uh, those two voices that you hear uh, on that clip, the baby they're talking about uh, was, in fact, uh, Chase Boudin. Chase, tell me uh, briefly about your parents and what we were hearing in that clip. Uh, my biological parents, Kathy Boudin and David Gilbert, who we just heard from, were, uh, you know, active in the civil rights movement. They were active in the anti-Vietnam War movement um, as students way before I was born. And, uh, you know, ultimately in the 1970s and 1980s, they began doing work uh, in support of black nationalists, black liberation groups, including the Black Panther Party, the Black Liberation Army. 
And in 1981, when I was just 14 months old, as you heard my mother describing, she and my dad dropped me at the babysitter um, the way they did, um, you know, pretty much every day back then. Um, and they never came back to get me. You know, that day while I was playing at the babysitter, they were driving the getaway car in a Black Liberation Army organized robbery of a Brinks truck. And the robbery went terribly wrong uh, from, from almost immediately. I mean, the a security guard was shot and killed. Nobody was supposed to get hurt. Uh, the, the, the people who committed the robbery, uh, as planned, left, went to where my parents uh, were waiting in a U-Haul. They got in the back of the truck. My parents drove off, and um, that car was stopped at a roadblock. Police um, came around to search the back of the car. People came out shooting. Two police officers were killed. And, you know, both of my parents were arrested that day. Uh, I don't remember their arrest. I don't remember who came to get me from the babysitter mm -hmm. much later that night. I don't even remember when years later, a judge sentenced my mother to 20 years to life and my father to 75 years to life. Uh, my earliest memories as a result of that tragedy, as a result of the choices my parents made, as a result of the, uh, of the approach this country takes to crime and to punishment, uh, are waiting in line to go through metal detectors at jails and prisons to get searched by prison guards just to be able to see my parents, just to be able to give them a hug. And, and what I remember most about those early years is noticing that those lines to get into the jails and to get into the prisons, they were mostly black and brown women and children. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and that, you know, yeah. No, I, I, didn't, I didn't want to cut you off, but, but I'm glad there's a pause there because it leads me to, to ask the obvious question which is for you to tell me more uh, about what you were seeing then. You've already started down this path. Let's continue. Tell me more, Chase, about what you were seeing then that would later cause you to be so committed to changing the system for people who were in that line with you that you ran for DA in San Francisco and were successful in that. But you'd committed long before you ran to doing your part for as long as you live. You're doing that now at UC Berkeley. We'll talk about that. But your life has been dedicated to trying to help those persons who were in that line with you. Tell me more about that experience and which, which, which led to the commitment that I just referenced. Well, you know, uh, I hadn't heard the term mass incarceration. I, I didn't understand as a kid the history of racism and the, 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 the ways in which slavery had metamorphosed into Jim Crow, into what we now see in our criminal legal system. I didn't understand any of that stuff as a kid. I just noticed, as I said, that the people in my par parents' prisons mostly didn't look like me. And over the years of visiting my parents in prison, decades, um, I mean, they spent a combined 62 years in maximum security prison, mm -hmm. I learned some really hard lessons, uh, lessons that most people who grow up with a kind of privilege and opportunity that I had, that I was lucky enough to have, uh, they never learned. And you know, I want to just share a couple of those lessons. I mean, at, at core, I recognized that this country's approach to public safety, to criminal justice, is failing us. And it's failing us in at least three core ways. The first one is that um, it is leading to what is appropriately called mass incarceration. The United States leads the world in locking people up. Right. And it's, and it's doing that at a tremendous cost. I mean, the second thing is for all that money we spend on building prisons, on funding police departments, um, we're not investing in helping victims of crime heal or recover or move on with their lives. And, and the third thing I recognize is that it, it's, it's actually bankrupting local communities. It's, it's starving them of the resources that are needed to actually make our neighborhoods safe. The kinds of things as, as a father of a young child that I want that I know will make my community safe, good playgrounds, good public schools, employment opportunities, housing for everybody in the community. We don't invest in those things in this country because we're too busy building cages. And so seeing that play out and seeing the failure to prepare people on the inside for reentry, to rehabilitate people, to have programming and, and transitional housing. Uh, you know, I went to law school wanting to fight against mass incarceration. And so after I, I graduated from Yale Law School, I decided to become a public defender in San Francisco. And then I saw, for years, handling individual criminal cases, defending people who were accused of crimes and too poor to hire their own lawyer. Um, I saw day in, day out, the, the ways in which the court system 
is stacked against poor people and people mm-hmm. of color. I saw the ways in which everyday legal practice in this country and our criminal courts makes a mockery of the words chiseled in stone above the United States Supreme Court, equal justice under law. Mm-hmm. Cash bail used to hold poor people even when they don't present a, a flight risk, while, while rich people who are dangerous can buy their way out. Uh, I saw judges you know, it, it send young fathers off to state prison, denying them a chance to even meet their newborn children. I saw clients who won their cases go back to communities where they still didn't have housing, still didn't have jobs, were still more likely to be stopped and harassed and searched and, and brutalized by police. And, and I got frustrated with the limits of being a lawyer fighting one case at a time. I wanted to do more systemic change. And I started doing impact litigation around money bail. I started doing work to help uh, protect our immigrant communities from ICE. I started doing work to launch new units and teams within the public defender's office. But it wasn't enough. And I was inspired. I looked around the country. This is 2018, Mm -hmm. 2019. I looked around the country and I was inspired by what at the time was a, a new emerging and growing movement within the broader criminal justice reform movement. And that, that, that current was called the progressive prosecutor movement. People mm-hmm. like Kim Fox in Chicago, people like George Gascon now in, in, in mm-hmm. Los Angeles, mm-hmm. people like Rachel Rollins in Boston, people like Larry Krasner in Philadelphia were running for and winning the office of district attorney in their jurisdictions by explicitly calling for reducing incarceration, for increasing accountability against those who so often violate the law with impunity, police, corrupt politicians, corporate billionaires in their boardrooms. And they were actually following through on their promises. I was inspired and I wanted to be part of that movement. Mm -hmm. And I recognized an opportunity in San Francisco because 2019 was the first time in over a hundred years when San Francisco had a district attorney race with no incumbent listed on the ballot. And I ran and I'm proud to say that I was elected by the people of the city and county of San Francisco. You were indeed, uh, and then you went to work, and that's where the story changes um, or pivots. Uh, because as I already said earlier, and most of you know this, I have a really smart audience who follows politics. Uh, Chase Bunin was elected in a historic victory uh, in the city by the bay. And then three days after he uh, got in his seat, hadn't found his way to the bathroom yet, I suspect, three days in, uh, a recall campaign started to take him out. Now, they've tried to recall George Gascon, who Chase Boudin mentioned earlier in this city. He survived that recall, but he's in a tough race now for re-election here in Los Angeles. Uh, Chase was yanked out of office there in San Francisco. And let me just tease this right quick, and we'll continue when we come forward. Glad I've gotten for the rest of this hour. I was just reading uh, an article. I've read a number of articles. In fact, Chase, I want to get your t- thoughts about this when we come forward. London Breed, the mayor of San Francisco, a sister, black woman, mayor of San Francisco, um, I'll let Chase offer his own thoughts about what role she played in his ouster. But she's now running for re-election in San Francisco. I like London Breed, personally. never done anything to me. I've been a guest on this program. But as a black woman, she is running really, really hard now for re-election on a law and order platform. And it has just blown people away that someone who was elected, who people thought was progressive, is now running on a really, really hard law and order platform in San Francisco. After Chase Boudin gets yanked out of office as a progressive DA, I do not understand what's happening right now in San Francisco. <laughs> and this is a progressive liberal city. I don't get it. We'll ask uh, Chase to explain that and talk about, in his case, what happened and why people became so politically schizophrenic as to elect him. And when he starts doing the work of being a progressive DA, they yank him out of office. And there's a great, great deal more to talk about regarding his backstory. It's going to be a great hour. Uh, for the rest of the hour with Chase Boudin when we come forward on Tavis Smiley. For all the freedom-loving folk, this is Tavis Smiley. I feel like freedom. Paid for by government.com. Did you know the United States Mint has issued a new Morgan silver dollar coin in proof condition for the first time? Not only that, they are also minted in 99.9% pure silver for the first time ever in history. 
Coin experts are calling this an amazing opportunity for anyone that knows the enduring popularity of Morgans. But you must hurry. Only 400,000 of these legal tender silver dollars were issued. These first ever Morgan silver dollars are brand new with stunning mirror-like finish, minted by the iconic San Francisco Mint. Call now and you're guaranteed a new first ever 99.9% pure silver proof Morgan dollar. To learn more, call 1-800-973-9717. If you order now, you will receive a free coin collector bonus pack a $25 value free with every order call 1-800-973-9717 now to secure your new morgan silver dollars before they are gone that's 1-800-973-9717 thank you for joining us i'm mike moore now here's the latest from the black information network former president trump's new york hush money trial will begin next month A judge rejected a further delay in the case and set jury selection to begin April 15th. Trump's lawyers had asked to have the trial to either be delayed or dismissed. This comes as an appeals court has lowered the bond Trump has to pay in his New York civil fraud trial. The court lowered the bond from $454 million to $175 million and gave him 10 days to make the payment. The first trailer is being released for the fourth film in the Bad Boys franchise. Bad Boys Ride or Die sees Will Smith. Bad Boys Ride or Die sees African-American actors Will Smith and Martin Lawrence reprise their roles as Mike Lowry and Marcus Burnett. And that's the latest. I'm Mike Moore from your 24-7 news source, the Black Information Network and BINnews.com. Every day, a child in poverty waits for a sponsor is another day of hopelessness. There are thousands of kids who've been waiting over a year in their wait. Sponsor a child with compassion today. Just text the word radio to 833-93. Is this the title? This is the KBLA Sports Minute with Ray Richardson. Richardson. USC is in the Sweet 16 of the NCAA Women's Basketball Tournament for the first time in 30 years. The Trojans beat Kansas by 18 last night at the Galen Center. Freshman All-American Juju Watkins had 28 points, 11 rebounds, and 5 assists. USC will play Baylor Saturday in the Portland Regional Semifinals. UCLA had a tough time with Creighton last night but held on to win by 4, 24 points from sophomore guard Kiki Rice. The Bruins advance to the Sweet 16 in the Albany Regional in upstate New York. Next up for the Bruins is the Defending national champion LSU on Saturday. The Clippers gave up 133 points to Indiana last night. They lost by 17. Fifth straight home loss for the Clippers. Russell Westbrook had 14 points and 7 assists in his first game back from a broken hand. LeBron's left ankle is bothering him again. He's doubtful for tonight's game at Milwaukee. No debates, no speculation, just the info you need. That's your KBLA Sports Minute. I'm Ray Richardson on KBLA Talk 1580. We've got a We've lot, got to, a talk lot about. to talk about. Hi, I'm Zoe Williams, a.k.a. The Voice of Reason, encouraging you to join me weekdays from 7 to 9 p.m. for the world's most intriguing relationship radio roundtable. Every night, I facilitate and encourage our loyal listeners to participate in the most engaging relationship discussions you'll hear anywhere. So make it a point to rendezvous with me, Zoe Williams, the voice of reason, Monday through Friday, 7 to 9 p.m. Pacific Standard Time. Trust me, your relationships will never be the same. The VOR is on fire tonight. Unapologetically progressive. KBLA Talk, 1580. We've got your black. Black. Talk 1580. Talk radio. That's music to your ears. ears. We're unapologetically progressive. KBLA Talk 1580. Some people just know the best rate for you is a rate based on you with Allstate, not one based on anyone else. So if you drive safely, you could save money. Good to know. Visit Allstate.com or call for a quote today. Psst. Hey, I have a secret. Uh-huh. I use Secret Whole Body Deodorant because more than just my armpits stink. Uh-huh. Can I use it with my bra rubs under my... 
oh, <laughs> yeah. And what about down there? You know, my... Totally. Four out of five gynecologists would recommend it. So I tried it, and now I get 72 hours of freshness. freshness. From my pits to my... Ooh, I love that it's a spray. Me too. And it comes in sticks and creams too. Go get your secret whole body deodorant. If you're looking for the most epic place on earth, let's start at the base of a massive waterfall. Then trek through the thick jungle. Then climb to the peak of a snowy mountaintop. Then once you get there, keep going. Because with intelligent 4x4 and 7 drive modes and a Nissan Pathfinder, the search is the real adventure. Available feature. Intelligent 4x4 cannot prevent collisions or provide enhanced traction in all conditions. Always monitor traffic and weather conditions. I have diabetes. I'm at risk for pneumococcal pneumonia. I have asthma. I'm at risk, too. If you're 19 or older with chronic conditions like asthma, diabetes, COPD, or heart disease, or are 65 or older, you are at increased risk for pneumococcal pneumonia. Ask your doctor or pharmacist about Prevnar 20, pneumococcal 20-valent conjugate vaccine, a Pfizer vaccine that can help protect you against pneumococcal pneumonia in just one one dose. Even if you've already been vaccinated with other pneumonia vaccines, Prevnar 20 may help provide added protection. Prevnar 20 is approved for adults to help prevent infections from 20 strains of the bacteria that cause pneumococcal pneumonia. Continued approval may depend on a supportive study. Don't get Prevnar 20 if you've had a severe allergic reaction to the vaccine or its ingredients. Adults with weakened immune systems may have a lower response to the vaccine. Side effects include pain and swelling at the injection site, fatigue, headache, muscle, and joint pain. For full prescribing information, please call 1-855-213-2138 or visit Prevnar20.com. Ready to re-examine your assumptions and expand your inventory of ideas? More of Tavis Smiley coming your way right now. Hey, collect call from Dave Gilbert. I could call him weekly for 20 minutes. Well, how are things at home? What's happening in school? Who'd you play with? And it became clear it wasn't that he was petulant, but he didn't really want to have a relationship where he was answering questions. He wanted to be doing something with me. And well, this led to our creating these serial adventure stories. Each 20 minute phone call would be a chapter. And at the beginning of the next call with the other parent, they would ask me to update them on you know, how far we'd gotten in the adventure story, and then they'd take it and sort of pass the baton. At some point, suspenseful point in the story, they'd say, well, what do we do now? How do we solve it? And encourage him to, you know, to come up with ideas that help move the story forward. I remember boating down the Amazon River, and they were exposing me to things like indigenous rights and environmental protection, and, and those stories were fun. How do you maintain a connection with people that you're apart from? And people have to do that around the world. When families are broken, destroyed, separated, immigration, displacement, all of it. The new documentary is called Beyond Bars. It is about the life and legacy ongoing, thankfully, of one Chase Boudin, uh, who many of you uh, recognize as the former DA of San Francisco, elected uh, in that wave of progressive DAs uh, that uh, came into office all across the country a few years ago, and then... As fast as many of them got in, um, efforts uh, to recall them um, got underway. Uh, and Chase Boudin uh, was the victim of one of those recalls. Uh, in the Bay Area, he's doing great work now as executive director of the Criminal Law and Justice Center at UC Berkeley School of Law. We'll talk about that uh, in uh, this hour, but I'm honored to have uh, the star, essentially, of this documentary, Beyond Bars. Uh, Chase Boudin is our guest um, in this hour. So, Chase, here's the obvious question. Uh, the big question is, what happened? We know these DAs, these progressive DAs got elected in San Francisco. What happened? And let me just put both of these out, and I'll shut up and pass the mic to you. I don't usually ask two questions at once, but I'll yield to you, sir. What happened, number one? And number two, what do you make of the fact that London Breed, the black mayor, the sister mayor of San Francisco, is now running on a law and order platform. I can't make sense of it. You tell me. Well, the first thing that's, I think, really important to, to recognize is that San Francisco has very different election rules than most places. Uh, for one thing, we use what's called ranked choice or mm -hmm. instant runoff voting. And what that means is we don't have a primary and a general. We have one election, nonpartisan, 
And voters pick first choice, second choice, third choice. If your first choice gets eliminated, then your ballot passes to whoever you put as your second choice and so on until you end up with somebody who has a majority of the remaining votes. Now, I'm not trying to uh, get too into the weeds, but this is important because I was elected in 2019. I had the most first choice vote. Five percent of people put me as their first choice. And after the other candidates were eliminated, I ended up with about 42 percent of the total turnout. And that was enough to get me elected because other people had fewer votes. But it's not as though I came into office with a strong, broad mandate. It was a four-way race. Um, and, and I ended up with uh, 85,000 votes, people who put me first, second, or third choice, mm-hmm. 85,000 total. Now, a month after I was sworn into office, month and a half after, COVID pandemic hits us, shuts down our courts, shuts down our businesses, our tourism, changes everything about how we live our lives, massive, massive transformation in our perception of safety and the way that we relate to one another as human beings. Uh, and obviously a lot of stress, a lot of loss. And the police union and a lot of people in City Hall who needed a scapegoat for their own refusal or incapacity to address deep-rooted, long-standing social problems in our city were looking for a scapegoat. And it was very easy to blame the guy who had just taken office, right? And, and so what happened was they spent about $10 million, the, the, the billionaire tech industry, real estate industry lobbyists, spent about $10 million to create this recall. The first time they tried, it failed. The second time they managed to get enough signatures and get it on the ballot. And when you have a recall in San Francisco, voters are not choosing between multiple candidates who put forward different policy platforms and ideas. They're simply voting yes or no. Now, I want you to imagine for a moment what would happen if um, President Biden were running for reelection, not against Donald Trump, but against himself. Mm -hmm. Yes or no. Shall he continue in office? I mean, the difference in percentage outcome would be staggering. Of course, we know that President Biden running for reelection against Donald Trump is going to get 50 percent of the vote, plus or minus a few points. If he were running against himself, there's a lot of people who would say, you know what, I prefer somebody else. But the way elections work in this country is we choose between candidates. That's not how recalls work. And so what happened in the recall was they spent unlimited money, no campaign contribution limits. It took advantage of fear and confusion and frustration in the context of the COVID pandemic. And they created an electoral event where voters were not choosing between ideas, policies, and candidates, but rather simply yes or no. They were giving voters an opportunity, in other words, to express their frustration with two years of life under the pandemic. And so what happened was in many ways surprising, not the outcome. The outcome was in many ways a foregone conclusion under those circumstances. But what happened that was surprising is we actually got more votes and a higher percentage of the vote against the recall than we did to get elected in the first place. 45% of San Franciscans voted against the recall. That's more in percentage terms than the 42% who put me as first, second, and third choice in 2019 when I was elected. And we had 100,000 individuals who showed up and said, no, let the man finish his job. Mm -hmm. He was elected to a four-year term, let him finish his four-year term. So I think the the narrative that we saw in a lot of the national news media um, in the summer of 2022 after the recall succeeded Mm -hmm. was trying to make a mountain out of a molehill. They were trying to say, San Francisco is a canary in the coal mine, the progressive prosecutor movement is dying, it's over. Uh, It's just not true. I mean, the reality is we won a hard fought race in 2019 and we would have won again if we'd been running against another candidate who came out and had to actually campaign on specific policies and platforms. So is that your way of saying that you believe, uh, unlike these headlines, that the progressive DA movement in this country is not over? It is not done. It's not finished. Absolutely, I believe that. Look, it's under attack. Yeah. Uh, let's make no mistake. I mean, they tried to impeach Larry Krasner in Philadelphia. They tried to pass a law in Chicago, uh, in uh, in Illinois, that would make it possible to recall Kim Fox, mm-hmm. the state's attorney in, in, in Chicago. She was going to be the only elected official in the state 
eligible for recall if that <laughs> law had passed. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, it's ridiculous. Governor DeSantis in Florida summarily removed from office two elected progressive prosecutors. Uh, we had two recall attempts against D.A. Gascon in Los Angeles. Mm -hmm. The movement is absolutely under attack. Its leaders are under attack. But that doesn't mean yeah. that it's in retreat or, or, or that it's losing ground. I mean, uh, District Attorney Pamela Price in Alameda was elected uh, in the same election cycle that I was recalled. Yeah. And so what we see is when in big cities, in cities with highly educated uh, urban populations, frankly, the populations that are most impacted by crime, when, when they're given the choice to elect somebody who says invest in treatment and rehabilitation, not only incarceration, yeah. when they're given the choice to elect somebody who says hold police accountable the same way we hold other people who commit crimes accountable, they vote for that yeah. choice. We, and, and polling shows us that it's, yeah, it's popular. It still is. Speaking of polling, we did a major poll here in L.A. This program is nationally syndicated. I'm grateful we heard across the country. But here in L.A., my home station, KBLA Talk 1580, did a poll recently about black attitudes, specifically on crime and justice, which connects to this conversation. I'll unpack that and more when we come forward with Chase of Boudin on Tavis Smiley. From the Merck Park with love, 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 this is Tavis Smiley. What is dedication? My biggest fear in the middle of my addiction was that my kids wouldn't have a father. And I started thinking, you know what? This isn't my story. I definitely had to become a better man to be a better father. It's important to me that my kids are empowered and truly believe that if, if they can think it, they can do it. That's dedication. Visit fatherhood.gov to hear more. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services and the Ad Council. Joey from Vermont. A farmer trying to get through the winter. Adriana from South Carolina. A single mother living paycheck to paycheck. Liam from Ohio, an injured father struggling to provide for his family. Hi, I'm Shanola Hampton, and I support the Feeding America network of food banks because they help provide over 6 billion meals to people in need each year. Learn more at feedingamerica.org. If you love to travel, Capital One has a rewards credit card that's perfect for you. With Venture X, earn unlimited double miles on everything you buy and turn everyday purchases into extraordinary trips. Plus, receive premium travel benefits like access to over 1,300 airport lounges where you just check in and chill out. Open up a world of possibilities with Capital One. What's in your wallet? Terms apply. Lounge access is subject to change. See CapitalOne.com for details. Some days I cover up because of my moderate to severe plaque psoriasis. Now I'm hitting the road with clearer skin thanks to Sky Rizzi. Rizemkism of Rizza, a prescription only 150 milligram injection for adults who are candidates for systemic or phototherapy. With Sky Rizzi, three out of four people achieved 90% clearer skin at four months. And Sky Rizzi is just four doses a year after two starter doses. Don't use if allergic to Sky Rizzi. Serious allergic reactions and an increased risk of infections or a lower ability to fight them may occur. Before treatment, your doctor should check for infection and tuberculosis. Tell your doctor if you have an infection or symptoms, such as fever, sweats, chills, muscle aches, or cough, or if you plan to or recently received a vaccine. Thanks to Sky Rizzi, there's nothing on my skin, and that means everything. your doctor today about Sky Rizzi, the number one dermatologist prescribed biologic in psoriasis. And visit SkyRizzi.com or call 1-866-SKY-RIZZI to learn more. There's only a few days left for open enrollment starting at $0 a month. LA Care Covered offers the benefits you need to achieve your health goals. $0 preventive services, 24-7 virtual care and nurse advice lines, walk-in minute clinics, free fitness and nutrition classes, and more. Become a member of LA's most affordable health plan. Get a free instant quote at LACareCovered.org. Have open enrollment questions? Connect with us today at 855-222-4239. Find your affordable path to wellness with L.A. Care Covered today. Who do you trust to get at the truth? Tavis Smiley. Tavis Smiley. That's who. The conversation continues right now. Before I talk about this poll that we did here in L.A., Chase Boudin, I mentioned London Breed. Um, there have been a number of articles, uh, national articles written about this sister mayor in San Francisco running now on a tough law and order platform. Um, any thoughts about that? 
Well, I, I was uh, disappointed to see um, someone who, you know, grew up in the projects who has incarcerated family members, um, you know, really abandon the communities and the people that, that, that she came from in favor of, uh, you know, a quest for her own power. Um, and, and, you know, I think it's just as someone who was in office and had to try to work with her, she was absolutely unresponsive when I reached out and said, hey, we need more money for victim services. Or when I said, hey, we're having a hard time getting the police to, to follow the law and, and, and to stop racially profiling black motorists. Uh, absolutely unresponsive and indifferent on those issues. So, um, you know, I was disappointed. I had higher hopes uh, for her as mayor, as somebody who I know has lived experiences I do with incarcerated family members. Um, and then she took things even, you know, to, to a new extreme in this last election where she encouraged San Franciscans to pass a proposition that's going to drug test welfare recipients. I mean, mm -hmm. that's the kind of far right wing mm -hmm. policy that we see coming out of the, the crazy right wing uh, Republicans in Congress. Yeah. And now we've got a, a San Francisco mayor supporting that. Uh, it's it's shocking. It's disappointing. Uh, and I think it's very dangerous. And among other things, um, our poll uh, here in L.A. Uh, found that black voters believe that D.A.s can stand to be a bit more progressive. So to your earlier point, that not only is the DA, uh, the progressive DA movement not dead in this country, never mind what they attempt to do to you in San Francisco, um, these, these black voters in Southern California are saying these DAs ought to be more progressive. Your thoughts? Well, I think it depends on the, um, you know, on the, on the jurisdiction and how we define progressive. I mean, I'll give you an example, Tavis. You know, for me, um, one of the things I was really proud to do when I took office was I, I was proud to re the the last person on death row out of San Francisco County mm -hmm. and, and get him off of death row. I'm still incarcerated, but get him off of death row. I don't believe in the death penalty. Right. There are some jurisdictions in this country where even if you're a progressive reformer, it's not politically safe to come out and say, I oppose the death penalty. Right. So I think we have to recognize there's a wide range. Um, there's a spectrum of politics across right. the country. And, uh, you know, we need to create more political space for people mm -hmm. to do things that reduce over-reliance on incarceration and increase equal enforcement of law and investment in victims' rights. The documentary about uh, the life and legacy ongoing of Chase Boudin, former San Francisco DA, now executive director of the Criminal Law and Justice Center at UC Berkeley School of Law. Uh, the documentary is called Beyond Bars. I highly recommend it. You will not be disappointed. Uh, it's available everywhere. You can just, <clears throat> excuse me, you can Google it. <clears throat> Excuse me, and find me. Uh, find it's called Beyond. I'm okay. It's called Beyond Bars. Uh, and uh, in our remaining moments with Chase Boudin, we'll talk about his work right now at UC Berkeley School of Law. You're listening to Tavis Smiley. Unapologetically progressive. progressive. Unapologetically blind. Black, black, black. You're tapped into Tavis Smiley. Tavis Smiley. Smiley. If you're like me, 60 and retired, making ends meet. Especially here at the supermarket and drugstore is tough. I'm so blessed to have found BenefitsCheckup.org. It's a free and confidential website from the National Council on Aging that connected me to $1,200 a year in programs that help pay for food, medicine, utilities, and more. Maybe it can help you. BenefitsCheckup.org. My daughter was diagnosed with a rare malignant rhabnoid tumor on the spine. They sent us straight to St. Jude. My hope was gone. But when you get there, everyone's like, hey, we're not going to give up. And when you see other people not giving up on your child, that makes all the difference in the world. When I found out I didn't have to pay, I was just grateful. They saved my baby's life. Finding cures, saving children. Learn more at stjude.org. KBLA Talk 1580. We've got a lot to talk about. Talk about. KBLA Talk 1580 reminding you that we keep us safe. Pro Football Hall of Famer and Urban Peace Pioneer Jim Brown believed in just that. So he founded the Amera I Can Foundation for Social Change in 1988, focusing on at-risk and high-risk youth in underserved schools and juvenile detention facilities, as well as adult incarceration and reentry initiatives. The core of the Amera I Can program is its 15-chapter life skills curriculum. Mastery of these skills allows individuals to meet their academic 
academic potential, conform their behavior to acceptable societal standards, and improve the quality of their lives by equipping them with what they need to confidently and successfully contribute to society. Today, the foundation is led by its president, Monique Brown, who has been actively involved in the organization for more than 25 years. The Amera ICANN Foundation continues its work in memory of its founder, actor, philanthropist, and NFL legend Jim Brown. To get involved or make a donation, please visit AmeriCanCommunity.partners. That's AmeriCanCommunity.partners. This is a community call to action from KBLA Talk 1580. My mom has taken up going to the park to practice yoga. My dad's going to a club, but not a book club, a salsa club. Finding new hobbies comes with age. My mom has started getting lost and not knowing where she's going. Becoming lost or disoriented doesn't. Confusion with time or place may be a sign of Alzheimer's. An early diagnosis can help improve the quality of life for your loved one. Learn the warning signs of Alzheimer's at 10signs.org. Brought to you by the Alzheimer's Association and the Ad Council. My ride smells just right, just right, just right, just right. Y'all gotta try that for Bree's right, car. Just right, just right, just right, just right. Yeah. La 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 la. With up to 40 days of consistency, all over Bree's car clips right on your vent. Yeah, you yeah. know my car is my happy place. Keep that smile on my face. When it smells just right, just right, just right. Yeah. Yeah. Breathe happy. Smart talk for curious people just like you. You're listening to Tavis Smiley. Smiley. Tavis Smiley and Chaser Boudin. Uh, we've got about three and a half, four minutes left here with Chaser. Um, Chaser, tell me about your work now at UC Berkeley School of Law. Well, I, I'm thrilled to be the founding executive director of the Criminal Law and Justice Center. And um, we work with students, we work with faculty, we work with community, we work with local government, state government. And we do work in three broad categories, Tavis. The first one is education. Second one is research, and the third one is advocacy. Um, you know, we, we're at a law school, so we, we help to bring educational programming to the students and from the school to the community. Uh, for example, um, earlier this year, we hosted a massive convening around California's Racial Justice Act. We had mm-hmm. over 500 people in attendance, both in person and over Zoom. We had Assembly Member Akara, the author of the law, give a keynote speech. And we had lawyers from more than half of the public defender's offices across the state of California attend to strategize about how to effectively use this new law that has such broad implications for people accused of crimes. Um, Similarly, we um, um, do a wide array of events. We've invited judges, federal, state, and tribal to come and speak uh, at campus. We've uh, hosted journalists. We've hosted uh, litigators and authors of books to come and share their work on criminal justice uh, with our students and with the broader community in the Bay Area. Yeah. Um, we hosted uh, a, a hero to many of us, Angela Davis, for mm-hmm. an inaugural event back in October. Um, and we um, are doing a lot of really exciting research, looking at things like the effectiveness of diversion programs at helping keep families together and reduce uh, rearrest rates. We are doing research looking at the ways in which uh, corporate media skews uh, 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 coverage of crime and public safety to undermine uh, criminal justice reform. Oh, yeah. uh, we are doing research looking at the failure of the state of California to adequately fund and supervise indigent uh, defense, public defender's offices, especially in rural counties. Uh, and we're working on a variety of advocacy projects, looking at uh, appropriate regulations for police use of surveillance uh, technology, mm-hmm. like license plate readers and, and face recognition. Yeah. Um, uh, Chase Boudin doing some great work, always has, for as long as I've known him, done some amazing work uh, in this arena of criminal justice. And God knows uh, there is a lot of work to do. I take a number of things right quick away from this conversation and from his life. Number one, there is life after elected office. Number one, there is life. Uh, number two, I told the audience yesterday, Chase, that Dr. King never ran for office, never had a radio show, never had a TV show. So clearly one can make a difference. Uh, for that matter, now that Malcolm or others, uh, clearly one can make a difference without being an elective office without having a media platform per se uh and you are a quintessential example of what we can do when we commit ourselves to making the world better when we leave it 
Then when we found it and uh, the backstory of your life is just all the more fascinating. The documentary is called Beyond Bars. And I was trying to say earlier uh, when I got choked up, uh, that you can find it anywhere and everywhere. Just just Google Beyond Bars. It's put out by a company called Brave New Films, our friend Robert Greenwald. It's free, F-R-E-E. You can, have, you can host screenings. They're doing a thousand screenings across the country. You can host one of those, have a conversation about criminal justice issues. I highly recommend you do a little research. Just Google Beyond Bars and all the details will pop up there for you. For now, Chase Aboudin, I celebrate you. I thank you always for your work and witness, and it's good to have you on this program, sir. Thank you for your kind words, onwards and upwards. Thank you, sir. More of Tavis Smiley when we come forward. KBLA 1580 Santa Monica. The trial will begin next month. A judge rejected a further delay in the case and said jury selection to begin April 15th. Trump's lawyers had asked to have the trial